Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty 6. It was mandatory for every male student at Phyllis Wheatley High to attend the monthly Young Black and Latino Men, Endangered Species, Assembly. Principal Henrietta Newcomb opened the meetings by reminding us that despite the portrayal of inner-city youth in the media, she didn't mention the name of the assembly, we weren't animals. These hour-long deprogramming sessions were supposed to liberate us from a cult of self-destructiveness and brainwash us into joining the sect of benevolent middle-class American normalcy. Once, before we listened to the motivational speeches, Principal Newcomb conducted an extemporaneous Gallup poll in hopes of uniting us against something other than ourselves. Raise your hand if, you are on welfare. You don't live with your parents. You're a father. You've ever been handcuffed. I raised my hand, much to everyone's surprise, especially that of Ms. Newcomb, who invited me to tell my story. You all see how any colored boy, no matter how academically and athletically gifted, is a target? What happened, child? I was reluctant to testify, so Principal Newcomb prompted me in her gentle manner. How old were you when the white man shackled you like a captured African animal? 8. You got arrested at age 8? Well, I wasn't exactly arrested. When I was in third grade, this cop visited our class to talk about his job and shit. Young man. Sorry. Then he started explaining what each item on his belt was for. When he gets to the handcuffs, he asks for a volunteer to help demonstrate how they work and chooses me, although I didn't have my hand raised. Anyway, the cop asks me to pretend I'm the bad guy and he handcuffs me, both hands. In the middle of reading me my rights, he asks me if I can get out of the handcuffs. I was so skinny I lowered my arms and the cuffs slid to the floor. The whole class is laughing. Then the cop says, don't worry, in a few years they'll stay on. Principal Newcomb nodded compassionately. See how they do a young nigger. Now I'd like to introduce this month's distinguished speaker. The monthly orator was usually a local businessman, community activist, obscure athlete, or ex-con. He'd bound up on stage with lots of nervous energy, wave, and say a hearty, what's up, fellas, to prove he was hip and could speak our language. Some speakers tried to rouse us with scare tactics. The ex-con showed off his scars and told butt-fucking stories. During the question-and-answer session the kids only wanted to know how many bodies did he have, did the tattoos hurt, and did he know so-and-so's brother. The mortician from Greystone Brothers spoke about how business was good and asked us if we could kill a few more niggers this week because his twins were starting college in the fall. Other community leaders tried to sway our self-destructive sensibilities with the flashy, superbad, black businessman pimp approach to empowerment. Great Nate Shaw, who owned Great Nate's Veal and French Toast over on Sentinella, made a grand entrance in a purple stretch limousine. Dressed in a tuxedo, cape, and top hat, twirling a pearl-handled walking stick, Great Nate strode down the auditorium center aisle looking like a lost member of the Darktown Follies just bursting to sing, that old black magic. His chauffeur trailed obediently behind him, carrying the shoeshine box that had catapulted the black Ronald McDonald to tacky affluence. Two weeks later some boys from Wheatley High in cahoots with his chauffeur followed Great Nate home, robbed his house, and kidnapped his wife. I heard they got more money from the Hollywood wardrobe agency they sold his clothes to than from the ransom Nate paid for his wife. The ex-football player scored points by passing around pictures of himself arm-in-arm arm on Caribbean beaches with bikini-clad white women. After his presentation, hands shot up, and Principal Newcomb looked so pleased, figuring she'd finally made a breakthrough. The first boy held up a Polaroid and asked the former jock, did you fuck this one? No matter who the delivery boy, the message was always the same. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. Treat our black queens with respect.
I made decent money taking bets on whether the distinguished speaker of the month would say, each one, teach one, first or, there's an old African saying, it takes an entire village to raise one child. I suppose I could afford to be snide. I had a personal motivational speaker, Coach Motom Chijiwa Shimamoto. The stereotype is that most successful black men raised by single mothers had a surrogate father figure who turned their lives around. A man who saw their potential, looked after them, taught them the value of virtuous living, and sent them out on the path to glory with a resounding slap on the butt. Coach Shimamoto didn't do any of those things. He just paid attention to me. The only time he ever told me what to do with my life was during basketball practice. There he constantly pulled and pushed me around the court. I was a skinny six-foot-four-inch pawn in the chess game unfolding inside his head. Kaufman, where are you supposed to be? Looking into his small hamster-brown eyes, which through his thick buddy holly glasses looked absolutely minuscule, I'd say, I don't know, coach. Coach Shimamoto, his face covered in perspiration, would snatch the bottom of my shorts and drag me to wherever it was I was supposed to be, droplets of sweat dripping off his nose and trailing behind us. You're here, Gunnar, raising his hands and demonstrating the proper technique for denying the basketball. If Roderick Overton gets the ball on the box, we lose, weak side help. Comprend, stupido. I can't say that I learned any valuable lessons from Coach Shimamoto. He never gave me any cliched phrases to be repeated in times of need, never showed me pictures of crippled kids to remind me how lucky I was. The only thing I remember him teaching me was that as a left-hander I'd have to draw from right to left to keep my charcoals from streaking. Coach Shimamoto was also my art teacher, and even there he was always looking over my shoulder, beads of his sweat splattering my watercolors. Other than Scobie, there was no one I talked to more than Coach. After practice he'd try to fatten me up on Chiritos and Chimichangas, while he told stories of how the G.I.s had taught him to play ball in the internment camp during World War II. He was never very good, but he was a hustler. It was his pluckiness and a front line comprising the Asazawa triplets, Ruth, Ruby, and Roy, that enabled his team to win the internment youth championships in 1945. The prize was the team's picture in the camp newspaper and a Caesar salad made with lettuce picked from his family's repossessed farm. Coach Shimamoto loved the purity of athletics, but the provincial protocol made him uncomfortable. Being a coach was tantamount to being knighted or elected president, the appellation and its circumscriptions stuck with you for life. Even Shimamoto's wife called him coach. Shimamoto often pleaded with me to call him something else. Gunnar, we're friends. Come up with a clever nickname for me like Chi Wiz or Moto Scooter. Coach, if you're going to be an authority figure, you've got to live with the dehumanizing consequences. I often think the real reason Coach Shimamoto faded me was to get inside Nicholas's head through me. Nicholas was his prize student, his ticket to high school coaching fame. Shimamoto knew that in 30 years reporters would call him at home and ask what it was like to coach, if not the greatest, the most unique basketball player in the world. Coach had his answer all prepared, he would tell them, Nicholas doesn't understand the game, but the game understands him. Both Nicholas and I entered 10th grade with solid basketball reputations. Nick was the wizard and I the sorcerer's apprentice. My duties were to get Scobie the ball so he could score, play tough defense so the other team wouldn't score, and bow reverentially after each dazzling feat the first game went as expected. We played our arch-rivals, the aeronautic high wind shears, in our first home game of the season. Aeronautic ranked fifth in the city, but Scobie made 17 straight baskets to lead the Phyllis Wheatley Mythopoets to their first basketball victory in four years. He made shots from all over the floor. He kissed one 35-foot bank shot off the glass so sweetly that the shot left lip prints on the backboard. After each successive basket, the legend of Nicholas Scobie documented itself shot by improbable shot, what was once urban lore was now irrefutable public knowledge. 
At one point Scobie shot a jumper from deep in the corner over the outstretched arms of three wind shears. The ball splashed through the net and the opposing coach turned red, stomped his feet, and yelled at his players to stop Scobie at all costs. One of the coach's obedient henchmen planted an elbow in Scobie's temple, which sent him into the stand's head first. As he staggered dazedly back to the bench, Psycho Loco walked onto the floor and paced back and forth in front of the aeronautic high bench, repeatedly slapping his thigh and challenging the team. You fools see this two and a half inch thick length of pipe from my crotch to my knee? That's not my dick, it's a Remington 12 gauge sawed off. The next motherfucker to touch Scobie is going to be performing shotgun fellatio and become a victim of some seriously unsafe sex. Unlike at the playground, here a collective self-esteem was at stake. People who didn't give a fuck about anything other than keeping their new shoes unscuffed all of a sudden had meaning to their lives. They yelled at the referees, sang fight songs, razzied the efforts of the other team. With the outcome of the game still in doubt, I was at the free throw line going through my routine. Three dribbles, I the front of the rim, deep breath. A voice barrel rolled out of the stands, demanding attention. Come on, Gooner, we need these. We? I didn't even need these free throws. I missed the first one on purpose. The crowd moaned and spit, instantly stricken with psychosomatic bellyaches. Please, make this next one, please, goddammit. They were hypnotized and didn't even know it, and I was the hypnotist. I had the power to make them cry or send them home happy, clucking like chickens. I sank the next one and fans stormed the court, and before I could look up at the scoreboard I was buried under a pile of exulting bodies. We won. We won. When I was finally exhumed by Coach Shimamoto, he asked me how did I feel, and I shrugged my shoulders with indifference. What a competitor. What self-control. That hold on your emotions will take you far, wait and see, Gooner. When he freed me from a playful headlock, I wanted to shout, but coach, I really don't give a fuck. But why spoil his joy? It was Nicholas's and my first organized game, and afterward over the phone we joked about how we didn't know to wear jockstraps instead of underwear, when the referee needed to touch the ball, what to say when the team huddled around coach Shimamoto and clasped hands. What did you say? I said, 1, 2, 3, eat me. You're supposed to say, 1, 2, 3, Wheatley. The next morning at school everyone was still in a trance-like state. Principal Newcomb, the district supervisor, and a photographer from the daily paper met us at the front entrance. We gathered around Phyllis Wheatley's gigantic cast-iron bust and posed stiffly for the photographer. The district supervisor tried to shake Scobie's hand, but Nicholas yanked it away at the last second. He had more trouble wriggling free of Principal Newcomb's cheek-to-cheek -cheek embrace. I stood off to the side, propped up by an elbow, leaning on the crown of Phyllis Wheatley's brass cranium. The caption in the next day's paper read, Wheatley's Nicholas Scobie and Gunnar Kaufman, ace students, ace athletes, and ace Boone Coons. Everywhere we went we were Wheatley High's main attraction. Teachers and students treated us with unwanted reverence. The murmur of everyone clamoring for our attention rang in my ears like a worshipful tinnitus. Girls slipped phone numbers into my pockets and rubbed the tips of their angora nipples on my shoulders. Boys bear-hugged us and enthusiastically replayed the entire game for our benefit. You niggers is bad. Money. When it was four minutes left in the half and you went baseline with that crossover and boo fed, boom, on that gorilla arrow high nigger, I swear my dick got hard. Mr. Dillard, the math analysis teacher, lectured on parabolas and hyperboles by using video excerpts of Scobie and me shooting jump shots at practice. Figuring we must be Newtonian geniuses to calculate the required force and proper trajectory to shoot a 20-ounce sphere through a metal ring only 18 inches in diameter while running and chewing gum, Mr. Dillard exempted us from homework for the rest of the semester.
To avoid the incessant adulation the day before a game against South Arabus High, we spent the lunch period in Coach Shimamoto's art room. I doodled in India ink and Nicholas sat at the pottery wheel, shaping amorphous clay blobs. Toward the end of the period, Nicholas was pumping the pedal so fast he couldn't get the clay to stay on the spinning disc. Fuck arts and crafts, he yelled as wet slabs of clay flew across the room, flattening themselves on the walls and windows. I'd never seen Scobie mad about anything. I knew he was agitated about the upcoming game, but I didn't know what to say to him. He was always the one who dispensed advice and remained in control. Whenever the crew got stopped for unjustified or justified police shakedowns, it was Scobie whispering, maintain, maintain. I looked to coach Shimamoto, but he was removing clay pancakes from his face and motioning with his eyes for me to say something first. I picked up Scobie's latest masterpiece, a still soggy, pockmarked, nondescript lump of clay, and turned it over tenderly in my hands. Nice work. This really captivates the frustrations of the underclass in an abstract yet immediate way. You should send this to the art museum, call it Gog and Magog White House Lawn Defecation. It's an ashtray, you moron. Yo nigger, why you so upset? We got a game tomorrow, just cool out. Man, I'm tired of these fanatics rubbing on me, pulling on my arms, wishing me luck. I can't take it. People have buttons with my face on them. They paint their faces and stencil my number on their foreheads. One idiot showed me a tattoo on his chest that said, Nick Scobie is God. Maybe you are God. You'll just have to accept the responsibility and let the clowns pay homage. I'm not no fucking tiki doll, no fucking icon. Don't folks have anything better to do with their lives than pay attention to what I'm doing? They're just trying to say how much they appreciate what you do. It'll get better, man, they'll get used to us winning. But they'll never get used to Scobie making every shot he takes, Coach Shimamoto interrupted. He sat down next to us, so overheated that steam rose from his body as if he were a giant humidifier. Nicholas, you're right, it'll only get worse. You've got to figure out how can you live with it. It's not fair. I wasn't born to make them happy. What I look like, motherfucking Charlie Chaplin. So miss once in a while. I can't. I can't even try. Something won't let me. Scobie's eyes reddened and he started to sniffle. He was cracking under the pressure. Watching his hands shake, I realized that sometimes the worst thing a nigger can do is perform well. Because then there is no turning back. We have no place to hide, no Superman fortress of solitude, no reclusive New England hermitages for xenophobic geniuses like Bobby Fischer and J.D. Salinger. Successful niggers can't go back home and blithely disappear into the local populace. American society reels you back to the fold. Tote that barge, shoot that basketball, lift that bale, nigger ain't you ever heard of Dred Scott? I'd never asked Nick Scobie about his gifts. I say gifts because Nicholas had other talents besides shooting a basketball, none of which had any real social value. He could read UPC codes at a glance. He'd look at the series of thin and thick black lines on an unpriced bag of pork rinds or a bottle of seltzer water and immediately call out the price. He also had the power to tell if someone had a drop of Negro blood in his gene pool. Nicholas claimed he could smell a passing octoroon from a block away. Whenever we went on junkets out of the neighborhood to the Beverly Hills Pavilion or the county fair, Scobie loved to approach unsuspecting Negroes living carefree in the white world and blow their consanguine but secret identities. Say, we missed you at the family reunion. Aunt Tessie wanted to know if you was still passing for Armenian. Nicholas could never explain any of his talents. If anyone asked about his hardwood perfection, he said that he'd heard his elbow falling out of a tree when he was little, and that when he cocked his arm he heard a little click telling him when to release the ball. Then he'd snap his arm for effect. 
His elbow cracked loudly, popping just as he said. But his weak explanation didn't account for distance or the various shots I had seen him make right-handed. Nicholas, why don't you just quit? Do what you do best. That's what I've heard my whole life. First it was hopscotch and now it's basketball. Hopscotch? Coach and I asked in unison. Yeah, when I first moved out here from Chicago I didn't know nobody, so me, and the other outcasts, the ESL kids, the deaf kids, played hopscotch to pass the time. I really liked the game. The sound of your keys sliding into the box, trying to lean from nines to pick up your marker in fours. Jumping from two to eights and clicking over sixes. Shit was a challenge. Anyway, the untraumatized boys chased me home every day. Since I used my house keys as a hopscotch marker, I always had trouble opening the lock. Usually I got the door open moments before the boys hunted me down. One day the key was so worn the lock wouldn't open, and these niggers waxed my shit right on my front porch. When my mother got home she made me wash the dried blood off the stairs and explain what happened. Then she yanked me over to the basketball courts. Don't tell me you had to fight every boy who beat you up? I asked, anticipating a common parental method used to turn squeamish young boys into men. No, she made every kid who beat me up play hopscotch with me. They had a good time, too. We was friends after that. Once I was accepted by the cool pack, I started playing basketball and stopped playing hopscotch with the retards. What happened to the hopscotch kids? They sit in the stands and scream like everybody else whenever I shoot the basketball. When the lunch bell rang, Scobie was feeling better. He smiled as if he had had a revelation and told coach he'd be at practice. After a light practice, coach Shimamoto divided the team into two squads for a scrimmage. Usually he divided us using some arbitrary criterion. White sneakers versus black sneakers, kids who'd never been to the dentist versus those who had. That day it was dark lips versus red lips. My upper lip is dark and the bottom one is cranberry red, so I was a bit confused and asked coach which team I should play for. Coach Shimamoto said that it was a blessing to be able to play for both sides and made me substitute for whoever was tired. It was strange playing for both teams, scoring for one squad then reversing my jersey and doing the same thing with the other. I was standing on the sidelines catching my breath when coach blew a jet of sweat from his brownish upper lip and said, Gunnar, you know in Japan they play Thai baseball games. Coach, I could give a fuck if I win or lose as long as both sides have a fair chance to play as hard as they want to play. Do the Japanese have Thai basketball games? No. Go in for Adriana, smartass. Nicholas didn't shoot much during that scrimmage or for the rest of the year. For us to win basketball games, I had to play like hell. Gradually, I realized that the decision Nicholas had made was to remove the burden of success temporarily from his shoulders and place it solely on mine. The classroom, locker room, and bathroom acclaim fell on me. I'd thrust my hips at a urinal and two cats on either side would glance up from their drippy glands and gleefully let out the interminable catcall, Gunnar Kaufmann. When kids discussed the team's prospects in the city playoffs, washing down mouthfuls of Dowie burritos with fruit punch, it was, Gunnar has held every all-city ballplayer we've played to fewer than four points. Gunnar is averaging 26 points, 9 rebounds, and 12 assists a game. When Scobie's name came up, they all said, oh yeah, that fool can shoot, but Gunnar has to carry us. Nicholas loved the shift in fame and willingly played his part in the role reversal, calling me, the deity, and asking me to forgive him for his sins. There are certain demands on a star athlete that I didn't anticipate or enjoy. The most arduous of which was having to participate in the social scene. Every weekend Scobie and Psycho Loco pressured me to use my star status to get them retinue privileges at the Paradise, the Rojo Sabala, or the Black Lagoon. When a club manager balked at admitting the volatile Psycho Loco into the establishment, 
I had to agree to take complete responsibility for his actions, which was like asking a dog collar to be responsible for a Rottweiler. Wringing their hands like mad scientists, he and Scobie thanked me for my kindness, ignoring the fact that I suffered from what the American Psychiatric Association Manual of Mental Disorders lists as social arrhythmia and courtship paralysis, meaning I couldn't dance and was deathly afraid of women. I wasn't completely lacking in social skills. With practice I learned to serpentine cool as hell through a crowded dance floor with the best of the high school snakes. I could hiss at the young women, but not much else. When the opening strains of the latest jam crescendoed through the house, would shout a perfunctory, he, showing the clubgoers that I was up for the downstroke and that at any moment there might be a party over here. Scobie and Psycho Loco would soon abandon my hepster front for the chase, melding into the swirling mass of bodies and leaving me to fend for myself. I'd watch Nicholas gyrate with Gwen Cummings or Thaisa Hammonds, sometimes both, their bodies one large ball and socket joint floating in the same soul sonic waves. Even Psycho Loco could dance. He did this little gangster jig where he leaned back into the cushy rhythms like he was reclining in an easy chair, kicking one foot into the air, then the other, sipping from a bottle of contraband gin and lemonade during the funky breakdown. Girls interested in dancing with me propped themselves in front of me, a little closer than necessary, swayed to the music, and tried to catch my eye. I stared off in the opposite direction, pretending to be engrossed in an intricately woven bar napkin and praying the girl wouldn't be bold enough to ask for a dance. As an athlete, I had a ready-made excuse for the nervy women who did ask, I can't, baby. Twisted my ankle dunking on the Rogers brothers in last night's game. I'd get a funny look in return, and the rebuffed co-ed would return to her circle of friends. The whispers and over-the-shoulder looks followed by phony smiles set off my social paranoia. My auditory hallucinations cleared their throats. Something wrong with that nigger, he don't never dance. Maybe he just shy. Maybe he's shy. He ain't shy with Coach Shimamoto. I think he fucking Coach Shimamoto. That's why Coach be sweating so much. Boy got some big ol' feets and hands, that's a waste of some good young nigger dick. Fucking an old man. Soon Scobie and Psycho Loco would interrupt my neurotic musings. Why you ain't dancing, Holmes? Crazy Honeys is checking you out. I don't feel like dancing. Are you crazy? There's some fine ladies in here. You just scared of women. Scared of pussy. On cue, Betty and Veronica would march over and demand the next dance, their tresses interlocked in a geodesic dome hairstyle that roofed their heads like an I, M, pay nightmare. I would mumble yes and they'd lead me onto the crowded dance floor. I'd stand still for a few seconds, vainly snapping my fingers with as much hope of catching the beat as a quadriplegic hobo latching on to a moving boxcar. Do what we do, Betty and Veronica would say reassuringly. I'd try to mirror my partner's undulating moves, but my body would fail to respond. I was stiffer than a mummified Gumby left out in the sun too long. Instead of bones, my skeletal structure was high-tension wire, and I plodded from side to side with all the mobility of a rusted tin man. Seeing my distress, Psycho Loco would bebop over to my rescue, force a couple of swigs of his liquid rhythm down my throat, then cruise the floors barking like the alpine Saint Bernard he was. Even with the lubrication of my joints and the steadying of my nerves, the quest for the beat wasn't over. Now I had to fight the urge to be too loose-limbed, prevent my arms from flaying about my body uncontrollably in an epileptic paroxysm. After a few moments I'd relax and settle into a barely acceptable, simple side-to-side -side step, dubbed by the locals the white boy shuffle. I wasn't funky, but I was no longer disrupting the groove. As the evening wound down, the house lights dimmed to a deep red haze and the DJ began to play the latest slow jams. Boys and girls floated across the floor superglued at the crotch, grinding each other's privates into powder in a mortar and pestle figure-eight motion. 
Unattached boys tried to look as if they had something better to do, and unattached women looked longingly in my direction, wiggling their hips in the vain hope of tantalizing me into action. I'd pray that Psycho Loco would start a fight so I could leave without having to support someone's head on my shoulder and listen to them warble inane love lyrics in my ear. Invariably, Psycho Loco came through, slugging some fool for stepping on his shadow or some equally petty infraction. As the bouncers escorted us out, Psycho Loco and Scobie compared the night's harvest. I got three phone numbers and Kenyana Huff pinched my butt twice. I only got one phone number. One number? Ah, but it was Natalie Nunez's number. Oh, you was talking to that? Damn, what did you say to get over? I told her that I'd get her a date with Gunnar if she let me take her to the UCLA Mardi Gras this Saturday. So Gunnar, how'd you do? Do people be staring at me when I'm out there dancing? It feels like everybody is looking at me. First off, you ain't you out there dancing. You out there having a brain aneurysm. You move so crazy it looks like you caught the Holy Ghost. Second off, nobody is paying any attention to your rhythmless behind cause they trying they own Mac on. Gunnar, do you even like girls? Yes. Which was true. I just had yet to meet one who didn't intimidate me into a state of catatonia. When you gonna get a girlfriend? I had one once in Santa Monica. What, some pasty white girl named Eileen, please? That don't count. Nigger, have you ever seen any parts of the pussy? Of course, man. I've fucked, er, been fucked, um, been fucking. I is fucking. Does the line go up and down or from side to side? During the ride home Psycho Loco would leaf through a copy of Bow and Arrow Outdoorsman, passing over pictures of grizzled white men snuggling with dead animals and articles entitled Ancient Hunting Tricks of the Mighty Neanderthal or 101 Tick Repellents That Don't Smell Like Grandma and heading straight to the classified ads in the back. Gunnar, we're gonna find you a wife. Here we go. Listen to this. Hot mamasans of the Orient seeking dates or soulmates inscrutable, demure, and pure by day insatiable, mature, and impure by night for color brochure send 50 cents to, mail order Asian geishas and dragon ladies box 900, Sacramento, California 16504. You're sick, you know that, right? Dude, I've never seen you voluntarily speak to a girl. This is the only way. Tried and true in defunct monarchies the world over. I'm serious now, say I won't. You won't. Two more years, bro. Soon as you turn 18 I'm marrying your frigid ass off. Somehow I knew that Psycho Loco was right, I'd never start a romance of my own accord. But it was difficult to accept sexual counsel from a pugnacious male who had to be drunk to fuck and whose first rule of courtship was, always make sure your dick is out. That way, no matter what happens you can say, well, I had my dick out. Maybe there was an advantage to arranged romance, no dates consisting of gauche attempts to be unceasingly clever and sensitive. Never having to deal with the living room interrogations from incestuously overprotective brothers and fathers. And I'd never have to put down the evening paper and say, listen, honey, they're playing our song. Still, I stuck to the Judeo-Christian ethics I'd picked up from American television and the English romantics, Ozzy and Harriet, Wordsworth and Coleridge. You crazy? How could anyone do that shit? Don't even think about it. It's like slavery or something. Changing the subject, I snatched the magazine from Psycho Loco's hands and said, my pop said Rodney King deserved that ass-kicking for resisting arrest and having a jerry curl. He said some curl activator got into Officer Kuhn's eyes and he thought he'd been maced, so he had to defend himself. The rest of the way home we talked about our experiences with police harassment, being frisked in front of our parents, forced to pull our pants down near the daycare center, made to wait face down in the street with our hands interlocked behind our heads and feet crossed at the ankles, gritty footprints on the nape of our necks.
Scobie said in county jail the guards call the cells Skinner boxes and have nicknames like the neuterer, Babe Ruth, and curtains written on their batons and riot helmets. Psycho Loco theorized that the guards beat on the inmates because they were afraid of them. He talked about how he once ran into a prison guard and his family at a hamburger haven. The guard was so nervous he pulled his off-duty revolver on Psycho Loco and accidentally shot Hamburger Harry, the mascot. The bullet passed through the lettuce, ricocheted off the pickle, and came to a stop in the mascot's brain. I asked Psycho Loco if the rumors about a gangland truce if the jury found the cops innocent was true. He said that there already had been a big armistice at the Trist N. Shout Motel. Bangers who had killed each other's best friends shook hands and hugged with unspoken apologies in their watery eyes. Damn, I hope they find those motherfuckers guilty, I said with surprising conviction. Not me, said Psycho Loco. I hope those boys get off scot-free. One, it'll be good to have a little peace in the streets, and besides, me and the fellas planning a huge job. Going to take advantage of the civic unrest, know what I'm saying. I pictured Rodney King staggering in the Foothill Freeway's breakdown lane like a black Frankenstein, two taser wires running 50,000 volts of electric democracy through his body. I wondered if the battery of the American nigger was being recharged or drained. Five-finger distance.